Our program today will, be, of course, be hosted by Ambassador Terry Miller. We've given copies of the book that he's chief editor of uh, for your future reference, as well as for reference during our presentation this morning. Ambassador Miller serves Heritage as the Mark A. Cola Catronis Fellow in Economic Freedom. He is also director of our Center for International Trade and Economics. Prior to joining us, he served for 26 years or more as a public servant and in the diplomatic corps. Among his appointments was serving as ambassador to the United Nations Economic and Social Council, uh, appointment by President George W. Bush. He also served before that as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Global Issues, as well as holding positions in appointment with the United Nations. Please join me in welcoming Terry Miller. Terry? Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I know many of you have come today to hear our keynote speaker, Secretary Wilbur Ross, and he will be joining us in a few minutes. In the meantime, it is my honor to present to you the 24th edition of our annual Index of Economic Freedom, which we are officially launching today here in the United States. I hope you picked up a copy of the index on your way in. If not, please uh, grab one as you leave the building today. I also want to recognize my co-editors of the index, uh, Anthony Kim, uh, who I don't see in the auditorium right now, and uh, Jim Roberts, who's sitting right down here in the front row. The index this year ranks 180 countries in 12 categories of economic freedom. We put those scores together to arrive at an overall economic freedom score that serves as the basis for the global rankings. Topping our rankings for the 24th year in a row is Hong Kong. The city's commitment to its free market and trading routes seems as strong as ever. A remarkable feat when you take into account the evolution of its political situation with mainland China. In second place, again, as has been the case in every year we have produced the index, is Singapore. Hong Kong and Singapore are the only economies judged economically free in every category of economic freedom that we look at. Other economies judged free in this year's rankings were New Zealand, Switzerland, Australia, and Ireland. Uh, there were a few other countries that distinguished themselves as leaders in economic freedom within their respective geographic regions. Hong Kong, of course, was the best in the Asia-Pacific region, and Switzerland had the highest score in Europe. The United Arab Emirates topped all countries in the Middle East, North Africa. Mauritius is the highest scorer among the countries of sub-Saharan Africa and its surrounding islands. And Canada is for the ninth year in a row the freest economy in the Americas. Now as a citizen of the United States, I have to say that that last fact is a great disappointment to me personally. This chart shows the bottom 20 and the top 20 overall scores in our index. I put it up mainly because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the United States, which has fallen over the past 10 years from fifth place to 18th place in the rankings. There was a slight uptick in the US score this year, which gives some hope that the decline is coming to an end, but we'll have to see the impact of the new policies like the tax cuts that were adopted earlier this year. On the other side of this chart, there are many sad stories, but none sadder, I think, than Venezuela, which ranked 46th in the world when we started this project in 1995, but now has fallen right to the bottom of the rankings, uh, just above North Korea. As you can see from this slide, there are only modest differences in economic freedom between the various regions. Europe has the highest average economic freedom score, and most European countries are found in the top half of the rankings. Sub-Saharan Africa lags behind. 
Differences within regions, however, are much more pronounced than the differences between regions. The Asia-Pacific region has four economies that are among the freest in the world. I mentioned them before, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, and Australia. On the other hand, it has three economically repressed countries, including, last place, North Korea. The Americas region is evenly divided between countries that are moderately or mostly free and those that are mostly unfree are repressed. Most countries in this region are grouped near the middle of the rankings. The vast majority of European countries are at least moderately free, contributing no doubt to the high levels of average income on that continent. The countries of the Middle East and North Africa are evenly distributed within the middle three categories of the rankings. Unfortunately, there are also four countries in this region that we were unable to rank because of political instability or violence. Sub-Saharan Africa has only one country that can be considered mostly free and eight others that are moderately free. The majority of African countries lack almost any significant elements of economic freedom, trapping their people at low levels of development. Despite these differences within and among the regions, there's one relationship that is constant. Countries with higher levels of economic freedom have higher, and in most cases, much higher per capita incomes than countries that lack freedom. This chart compares incomes in the five freest and the five least free countries in each region. In addition to celebrating countries that do well in the rankings, we also like to recognize countries, no matter their ranking, that have made significant improvements in economic freedom this year. Haiti had the biggest overall gain in economic freedom with a major effort to get its fiscal deficit under control and significant improvements in the rule of law. Barbados, however, made the biggest jump in the rule of law category with big gains in judicial effectiveness and reducing corruption. Slovenia was the most improved in respecting the concept of limited government with a big effort to get its budget deficits under control and also control of its government debt. And Tunisia had big gains in both trade freedom and investment freedom and pushed its open market score up by almost 10 points. Ukraine made gains in all three of the regulatory categories. That's business freedom, labor freedom, and monetary freedom. And that, I think, shows that economic progress need not stop for countries facing internal or external political challenges. We measure these categories independently, but they do interact with one another. Progress in one area can enhance the benefits from policy changes in another, and the importance of a particular category may vary depending on a country's level of development. There's one category, however, that stands out as especially relevant to countries at all levels of development, and that's the freedom to trade. The freedom to trade is highly correlated with overall economic freedom and prosperity, both for the world as a whole and within every region and at all levels of development. I want to move on now to highlight some of the ways in which economic freedom makes a difference to people around the world. We can see here that economic freedom has been trending upwards over the life of the index. Over that same period, global GDP has just about doubled, and poverty rates have dropped by over two-thirds. In an economically freer world, billions of people have escaped poverty and enjoy for the first time ever the opportunity for economic advancement. The benefits of freedom can also be seen by comparing countries at a single point in time. This slide shows the correlation between economic freedom and gross domestic product per capita. 
Those living in economically freer societies enjoy much higher incomes on average than those where freedoms are restricted. And the benefits from improvements in economic freedom, once you've achieved a basic level, say a, a score of around 60 or so, those improvements uh, can be quite dramatic. Just look at the steep slope of that curve on the left-hand side. On the other hand, one of the most interesting results of the index is that for countries at any level of economic freedom, there's a correlation between changes in economic freedom, that is improvements, and economic growth rates. No matter how low your current score, you're likely to see improvements in economic growth if you take steps to improve your economic freedom. The positive relationship holds over all time periods here we show data for 5, 10, and 20-year periods. And in all cases, countries that have improved economic freedom the most had the highest growth rates on average. Wealth and income are not, of course, the only or, or even perhaps the most important factors in a society's overall well-being. In the 2018 index, we've looked at the relationship between economic freedom and a variety of indicators of social well-being. At the broadest level, as you see here, there's a strong correlation between levels of economic freedom and performance on two widely used indexes of social well-being, the Human Development Index and the Social Progress Index. Looking at some specific areas, we see, for example, that children in freer economies are able to stay in school about six years longer, on average, than children in repressed or mostly unfree societies. This will have a huge impact on those countries' future prosperity. Economic freedom also promotes better health care and longer life. Here we compare longevity in countries with less or more economic freedom. The average lifespan in countries at the lower end of the economic freedom scale is about 66 years. In countries with higher levels of economic freedom, average life expectancy is over 76 years. That's 10 more years of life on average for those whose governments allow them more economic freedom. Finally, in this age of concern about global warming or climate change, there's a cautionary note from the data for those who believe that it is imperative for governments to impose ever greater emission standards or other environment controls. As with other areas of social progress, it's economic freedom, not government regulations, taxes, or subsidies that has led to the most improvement in environmental conditions. In closing, I want to highlight what we call four critical countries for improvement. These are countries with large populations that have taken the first baby steps towards economic freedom, but are still mostly unfree. China, for example, made major reforms under Deng Xiaoping, but since has promoted a hybrid system that combines participation in the global trading system with centralized planning and control of investment. As growth rates slow, the contradictions of such a mixed approach are likely to become more and more difficult to manage. India has abandoned the rigid adherence to socialism that characterized the early years of its independence. But it has achieved only modest progress in under unwinding its massive bureaucratic state. With only a nine-point advance in economic freedom over 24 years, the pace of reform is too slow for a country that aspires to world economic leadership. Russia. Hmm. The communist policies of the Soviet Union are lar largely gone, but authoritarian control favoring a wealthy oligarchy and state-owned enterprises has stifled advancement for entrepreneurs and innovators. This results in an over-reliance on commodity-based growth. And finally, Brazil. Brazil's economic freedom score this year of only 51.4 is identical to its score in the first edition of the index in 1995. 
the country's gotten stuck repeating policy mistakes in what seems to be a never-ending cycle of futility. All of these countries are in some respects stuck, each in need of a burst of free market reform to jumpstart broad-based and sustainable economic growth to the benefit of their large populations. That's the end of my presentation. All of our index results are available online along with supporting data and historical analysis. Uh, I'd be happy now to take questions while we await the arrival of Secretary Ross. Uh, yes, sir, if you'd wait for a, a microphone, uh, we'll have a microphone. Please identify yourself, and then uh, I'd be happy to hear your question. Yes, uh, Carl Golovin. I see one of your criteria is monetary freedom. Can you please explain what the parameters are that you consider to be relevant to monetary freedom? Uh, yes, we call that monetary freedom. It's basically a measure of inflation uh, in economies over a three-year period. We use a rolling average of inflation uh, that counts current levels um, more significantly than former levels. But we also look at price controls in the economy and the extent to which governments are interfering in the market in a variety of ways to influence prices. Yes, sir. Peter Semler, um, I had a question. A couple of your slides were of great interest. These are markets that our subscribers, readers are invested in as your most improved Haiti, Tunisia, and Ukraine. Can you give us more details? These are what we call our early growth markets. Yes, well, um, I, I think Haiti is a, is a classic case where there's extremely low level of economic freedom at this time, and so they're really scrambling to come out of, a, of a, what's a very poor situation in that country, and they've suffered, of course, from earthquakes and uh, other events that have uh, held them back even more. But I think the thing that we see long term is that there's a tremendous problem with corruption and lack of the rule of law in a country like that. And this year, they did make some concerted efforts to Im improve. And I should point out in this um, regard that our data is covering the period from um, mid-2016 to mid-2017. So we're dealing with a little bit of a time delay here. Uh, but we did see a progress there. I, I think there was more obvious progress in, in countries like Ukraine where we've really seen a very strong effort there to improve economic policies and, and get economic growth going quickly in spite of the political and security challenges they're facing from Russia right now. Uh, Tunisia is a case that we have paid a lot of attention to, obviously the birthplace of the Arab Spring uh, that didn't perhaps spring forth as uh, far as, as we would have liked to see in, in many of the countries in the region. Uh, but they seem to have um, stabilized the situation there, and they are putting in place policies to open the economy and um, make uh, better use of foreign investment and um, the trade markets that are available to them. So that's what we saw there. Uh, back here. We're... Jeffrey Osanka, where, if anywhere, do you take into account when a country uses its economic freedom uh, to spend money to make countries less free? I'm thinking particularly with Qatar, which uses some of its money to uh, sponsor states that, that uh, try to reduce economic and political freedom in other countries. Well, that's obviously a problem. Uh, we measure... Um, what we measure on an even-handed basis for, for countries, um, and we're not looking at political developments or even political actions by countries um, in other countries around the world. That's for others, I think, to use. Um, Cotter is not what I would call a champion of economic freedom. They score in, the, I guess, the upper half of the Middle East region rankings. Um, and. Uh, I guess we just didn't take a look at what they do with their wealth once they have it. So that's a that's a question for others, I think. Uh, let's go over to this side of the room, um, back in the back. Terry, excellent uh, summary. Michael Maybach, thank you very much. 
as you know, 28 countries are members of the European Union and 19 in the Eurozone. Did you look to see the impact, either positive or negative, on either of those two institutional uh, regimes? Oh, well, the European Union, I think you have to look at that um, uh, in the long run. Um, the, the European Union grew out of a desire to um, eliminate war on the European continent. And for those of us who are, I'm not quite old enough to remember World War II, but I certainly do remember its aftermath. And um, the um, effort in, in Europe to overcome those um, intercontinental rivalries and, and um, establish a peaceful and coordinated regime there, I, I think, um, has certainly served that purpose to a, a pretty large extent. Um, these days, they've gone way beyond economic cooperation and this, uh, the extent they're trying to form political unity. And I guess the index is not really the right place to comment on, on that factor. Uh, but certainly to the extent that they have created a free trade zone within the European continent in the way that the United States of America is a free trade zone and, and NAFTA enlarged even um, a North American free trade zone, that's all to the good, I would say, from an economic point of view. Uh, but then you have to worry about, in, uh, in Europe, the bureaucratic regulatory process that perhaps is not as democratic as it might otherwise be. And, and see if that's not, in some respects, a little bit out of control. So um, I, I know that's not a very straightforward answer, but I think it's a very complicated situation in, in Europe. And, and the same thing I just said about the European Union would all hold for the Eurozone as well. When you take uh, control of monetary policy away from the individual countries, um, that can be a problem and, uh, and hurt them as they try to adjust or use monetary policy to adjust other factors of the economy. On the other hand, it seems to impose a certain amount of discipline, at least in theory, on what they can do with deficit spending and, and getting their debt levels out of control. So um, again, I would say it's a mixed, a mixed picture. Yes, Barbara? Um, wait for the microphone, please. I just would like to hear a little bit of a review of what criterion you use in evaluating trade freedom. Oh, well, for trade freedom, we're using mainly the, um, the applied tariff rates, not the published tariff rates, but, um, but weighted according to what products, excuse me, what products are coming in. So it's a trade weighted average uh, for tariffs, and then for non-tariff barriers, we look at all kinds of regulations and even things like the extent to which corrupt practices may impede trade flows. So that's an additional measure uh, for trade freedom. Uh, yes, sir, here. In Vallis, uh, probably the, one of the greatest achievements in the Trump administration has been to almost stop the regulatory state. Now, are these efforts too much in the infancy for you to put them into account in, in the uh, ratings of the United States? Stop what? The, the regulatory. Ah, uh, yes. Because the, based on the uh, uh, things we've seen in 2017, uh, including the Federal Register, there's been an enormous sea change in regulations. Is it just too early? Yes, I, I, that's one of the most positive achievements of the Trump administration so far, in our view, and um, it's bound to have an important positive impact on trade freedom here in the United States. Um, but it is, in fact, too early for us to have been able to take account of those changes in this year's edition of the index. Uh, we will be picking that up strongly next year. Um, in the index, uh, as well as changes from the tax reform. So there is some hope that the U.S. score will improve, and I would caveat that only with the um, issue of trade policy, uh, which seems to be going in the opposite direction at this time. So I, it would be very hard for me to predict exactly what will happen to the U.S. score in the, in the year ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, my, my name is Anshum with Inside U.S. Trade. I just had a follow-up question on the trade freedom question. To, to, to what extent did the sort of the, 
some of the U.S. policy actions factored to this year's score, the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, renegotiation of NAFTA, um, w what actions went into the U.S. trade freedom score? Was that a decrease? And if you could just comment on sort of the global trade freedom as you see it as well. Thank you. None of those actions have had an impact yet on the score because they come after our cutoff date for the data for this year's edition of the index. Uh, but we would anticipate that any new imposition of tariffs uh, could have some impact on the score. Um, it depends on the extent of those tariffs, of course, and, and right now I would say that's an open question. Uh, we've had a lot of announcements of proposed actions by the Trump administration and by other countries, uh, sometimes in response and sometimes on their own. And uh, I think we need to wait and see what actually happens in terms of the imposition of tariffs and what impact that has on trade flows around the world. Then we'll be able to judge better what's, um, what's actually going on. Well, I see our, um, our distinguished guests have arrived, so I think that better be the last question. I, I'd be happy to answer questions after individually after the program is over. It's uh, my honor now at this point to introduce the distinguished president of the Heritage Foundation, Kay Coles James. Mrs. James has an extensive background in crafting public policy and leading in nearly every sector of America's economy, and she brings a wealth of experience to this position. Having served on the Heritage Board from 2005 to 2018, and in the conservative movement for more than 30 years. During that time, she's made conservative solutions a reality at all levels of government, including during her service as director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management from 2001 to 2005. Most recently, Mrs. James was the founder and president of the Gloucester Institute, an organization dedicated to training and nurturing leaders in the African-American community. She's a graduate of Hampton University, the recipient of numerous honorary degrees, and a best-selling author. Most important, her words, those, she's married to Charles James Sr. and is the proud mother of three and grandmother of five. Please join me in welcoming Kay Coles James. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to this special event and to introduce our esteemed guests. For 45 years, the Heritage Foundation has been dedicated to building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. This is not a throwaway line to anyone uh, who works in this building. No, it's our battle cry against the tide of human history. You see, for literally thousands of years, the vast majority of people lacked economic freedom and opportunity. And as a result, they were condemned to demeaning, dehumanizing lives of poverty, sickness, and sometimes early death. A few people controlled most of the power and most of the wealth, and everyone else suffered for it. Thankfully, those days are over for more people today than at any previous time in human history. But we still see instances, such as in North Korea, that serve as a stark reminder of where we've come from and where we could return if we don't remain dedicated to building a better future. That's what the Heritage Foundation is all about, and it's why our index of economic freedom is so vitally important. The index chronicles the advance of economic freedom and its defeat of poverty and privation. With detailed analysis presented in a user-friendly format, the index has served as the go-to resource for policymakers, researchers, and students for more than 20 years. It covers 12 freedoms in 186 countries, revealing the essential link between free markets and prosperity. And as a result, the index has inspired positive policy change around the globe improving the lives of millions of people. You see, economic freedom leads to better health, longer lives, improved education, and cleaner environments. 
It expands markets and improves standards of living. And it brings societies closer together in peaceful cooperation that transcends race, religion, and culture. In sum, the index reveals a powerful truth. Governments that respect and promote openness and free markets make their citizens' lives and the world better. And it's for that reason that we are deeply honored that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross is with us today. Secretary Ross is not only an extraordinarily accomplished businessman with degrees from Yale and Harvard, and a record of generating jobs and prosperity at more than 100 companies, He's not just a universally acclaimed expert, having been named by Bloomberg Markets as one of the 50 most influential people in global finance. Yes, he's even far more than that. And he not only serves as the Trump administration's principal voice for business, job growth, and economic opportunity, he is a staunch, lifelong believer and the undeniable truth that inspires our work here at the Heritage Foundation every day. That is, with freedom and opportunity, people everywhere can rise up from poverty and be empowered to live healthy, productive, and fulfilling lives. I can therefore think of no better guest to speak at this special occasion than our dear friend at the Heritage Foundation, Secretary Ross. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kay, for that very kind introduction. It reminds me a little bit about Henry Kissinger one time was delivering a speech, and before it, he got a very, very elaborate introduction, following which he immediately said, given that introduction, I can't wait to hear what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, for some 45 years, Heritage Foundation has been a leading advocate for the values we in this room hold firmly. Free enterprise, limited government, a strong defense, and a prosperous and secure America. It's a pleasure to be here for the Washington launch of the latest Index of Economic Freedom. I'm here today because I believe that next year and at least for the next seven odd years, our possession as the United States in the index will hopefully continue to improve. As of the June 2017 cutoff date for policy changes to be taken into account, we didn't yet have very many of the deregulatory actions that we now have taken. We didn't have many EPA reforms. And we certainly didn't have the largest tax cut and tax reform in history. So we hope that those very specific developments will help propel us up in next year's and in succeeding years. Since the index was created by Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal in 1995, it's become an indispensable tool in promoting the benefits of economic freedom. It is used by governments, individuals, investors, business in, businesses, NGOs, and the media, in capitals and C-suites throughout the world. It is a recurring reminder of how important freedom is to individual and collective prosperity. And it provides governments, including our own, with an objective critique of the economic conditions in each country. It is these conditions upon which governments are held accountable by increasingly discerning and educated citizens. In short, the index is an essential service provided by heritage. I congratulate the six economies that earned the index's top designation of free with scores of 80 or better. Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, 
Australia, and Ireland. It is, to say the least, disconcerting that the United States is not yet part of this elite group. Although globally, economic freedom has hit an all-time high. It's imperative that we acknowledge and address the reasons for which our country lags behind the 17 nations that are ranked above us. The good news is that thanks to President Trump, we believe our downward slide in the index over the past decade not only has come to a halt, but should be reversing itself. The United States was one of 102 countries out of 180 whose scores improved in this latest report. But the latest US score of 75.7, about six tenths of a point above the previous report, is the right direction, but it's coming from a base that was the lowest in the index's history, due to no fault of the present administration. It is an indication that after a decade of economic stagnation and decades of overregulation, we have hit an historical inflection point. Fifteen months ago, President Trump took office with a specific agenda to unleash our economy and improve job opportunities for millions of Americans. A key element of that agenda was lifting the heavy yoke of government from the backs of American businesses and workers. As I speak, the administration is continuing to review and eliminate outdated and ineffectual rules and regulations <coughs> whose costs in time and money vastly exceed their benefits. The president has mandated that for every new federal rule created, at least two of equal value must be repealed. In fact, we've done better than that by a very wide margin. In the last year, the president repealed a whopping 22 regulations for every new one issued. Just today, I and 14 other cabinet members signed an MOU among us implementing the One Federal Decision Framework for Environmental Review and Authorization Process for Major Infrastructure Projects. That's one of the areas that is the most fiendishly regulated in the country. You may have seen a chart that I have in my office. It's a little taller than I am, and what it contains is the 120 different steps that someone must go through to get a permit for a major infrastructure project. With that many steps, it's a wonder anything ever gets built in this country. It takes years and years to get the permits. One private sector company, Rio Tinto, is a horrible example. It's a good company, but the thing that they've gone through is horrible. They have spent several hundred million dollars in 10 years working to get permit to open what will probably be the world's largest open pit copper mine ever. They still don't have the permission to do it. Now, they're a big company. They can afford the hundreds of millions of dollars. They can afford the 10 years. But think how much better off they and everybody would be if they could put that extra few hundred million into projects rather than into paperwork. Because that's what it's been. Paperwork and litigation have been the horrible things. In addition to deregulation, the tax burden that has stifled growth has also been lifted. As you know, last December, President Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. President Trump has reduced taxes by $5.5 trillion over the next decade, the biggest tax cuts and reforms in American history. And for the first time in more than 30 years, 
U.S. companies have a competitive tax rate that will bring prosperity to millions of Americans. We know that it is the private sector that drives the prosperity, not the federal government. Since the reduction of the corporate tax rate on American businesses from 35% to 21%, more than 440 large companies have announced new investments, raises, and bonuses that are directly benefiting more than 4.5 million American workers. And all working families get a well-deserved raise now that they are keeping more of their hard-earned money. The new tax law changes our present, our former, worldwide system to a territorial system, thereby ending the penalty on companies headquartered in the United States, and it's making their domestic operations more globally competitive. In addition to tax cuts and deregulation, we are taking a new look at our trade relationships with the intent of reinvigorating U.S. manufacturing production and output. We are working to end years of one-sided and unbalanced trade deals that disadvantaged U.S. businesses and workers. Other companies simply have refused to play by the rules. Their continuous dumping of government-subsidized products has decimated essential American industries. It threatens our national security, and it saddles our nation with global trade deficits that exceed half a trillion dollars annually. <clears throat> These deficits are draining wealth from our nation. I'm proud of the fact that President Trump has forcefully stood up for the interests of American industries that are essential to our national security. We believe that trade should be fair, free, reciprocal, and free, free, free. But free trade is almost like the unicorn in the garden. People talk a lot about it, but it's very, very hard to find it nowadays. Our tariffs are among the lowest of any major country in the world, and we have the least in the way of non-tariff trade barriers. Yet American exporters are plagued by every type of tariff and non-tariff barrier thrown against them, even by our most trusted allies. In Davos recently, I had a, was on a panel with the director of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and to start things off, I asked him the question, said, if the United States is not the least protectionist big country, please tell me who is. He had no answer. So we are using all of our available tools to ensure a level playing field for our countries, companies, workers, farmers, and ranchers. And we're already getting results. Our new deal with the Republic of Korea is lowering barriers to automakers and other key American industries, a major win for the cause of economic freedom. Maybe it will inadvertently push Republic of Korea up in your freedom index the next year. And we can also see the impact of our economic policies on the whole world. After a decade of stagnation, we're finally growing at about 3% again, something the naysayers said could never happen. The number of Americans collecting unemployment benefits is at a 45-year low. Consumer confidence is at a 14-year high. Two million Americans have moved off food stamps and onto work rolls. And since Election Day, American companies have created nearly three million new jobs. 
manufacturing sector is particularly showing renewed strength. In the last year, more than a quarter of a million new manufacturing jobs were created in the United States, compared to 100,000 manufacturing jobs lost in the final year of the Obama administration. New factories are opening throughout the country. During the first nine months of 2017, the United States experienced a net addition of more than 4,000 new manufacturing plants. After decades of industrial decline, we have finally turned the corner. None of these positive things were happening before the election of President Trump. So judge him by the results. Judge him by the results, not by mannerisms, not by catchphrases, not by 160 character tweets. Judge the administration by its results. President Trump is unleashing American ingenuity. Now, of course, there's more to do, a lot more to do. This administration is next going to be focused on reducing government spending, something that will require more much-needed reforms. The last spending bill was quite unfortunate. The Democrats used the nation's need for the military to have increased funding as an opportunity to load up the bill with their own wasteful spending. But as the president said, he will never sign such a bill again, never. We will also continue our march to cut unneeded regulations. We look forward to working with Heritage to get the United States to where it belongs, at the top of the Economic Freedom Index. Again, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I gather now we're going to have a little fireside chat. Well, you probably have heard the president recently say the trade war, a trade war, has been going on for the last 50 years or perhaps more. The only difference is now the American troops are coming to the ramparts. And that's what's causing all the kerfuffle uh, with the other countries. Uh, we have a little editorial that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal some months ago that we're distributing around. I think it will give you a perspective on trade, trade policy, and trade barriers. But while that's being handed out, I'll just cite a couple of little arithmetic instances that you might find interesting. One of the concerns people have is a big trade war with Mexico. Well, we don't want a trade war as such with them or with anyone. But here's the fact. Pre-NAFTA, every year, the United States had between a four and five billion dollar trade surplus with Mexico. Any of you have any idea what our cumulative trade deficit with Mexico is post NAFTA. Do you think it could be as big as $100 billion? Anybody think? Okay. Anybody go for $200? Oh, you can't bid against yourself. <laughs> <laughs> How about $500? Nobody thinks $500. Oh, and did you miss think $500? The real answer is it's more than $1 trillion. So one result of NAFTA was to create a gap 
we went from recurring trade surpluses to a trillion dollars in the hole. It's a hell of a good negotiation, don't you think, to accomplish that. So that's why we're doing that. And to varying degrees, same thing is why we're having to re-examine other relationships. Now, I've done business in over 30 countries on the ground, importing into them, exporting from them. And I, I can tell you it's an ugly playing field out there. People do not adhere to the rules. They do not adhere to fair play. And unfortunately, U.S. got itself into predicaments that it didn't need to. What happened in the immediate aftermath of World War II, it was U.S. policy, and probably not a bad policy at the time, to help rebuild Europe and Asia from the ravages of World War II. Well, that was a good idea. We needed to help them. And at that time, we had trade surpluses, consistent trade surpluses, and indeed we did until into the 1970s. The problem is the concessions that they made to the then struggling countries had no time denomination to them. So concessions that were totally appropriate to make to a Germany, to a Japan, to a Korea, to a lot of these countries back in 1950 are now totally inappropriate. And yet because of what we've signed up for, we have relatively little flexibility. And because our tariffs are so low relative to everyone else, they don't have a lot of incentive to negotiate. So we've been trying to create some incentives for them to do so. And that's what a lot of these trade actions are about, particularly our enforcement actions. Well, Mr. Secretary, we only have time for one more question. Which one would you like? Oh, my goodness. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think I can answer both of them. First yeah. one I'll answer is pretty quickly. This talks about. Well, would the, you like for me to read the question? No, sorry, I'll, I'll just summarize it. Okay. The recent budget legislation was a deep disappointment to fiscal conservatives. Well, it was to me too, was to the president as well. Uh, but as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, the Democrats took hostage our need for national defense. And because the Republican Party was splintered, the only way to get any bill through was to deal with the Democrats. And dealing with them brings a price, a, a price of a lot of things that in we would not have even contemplated in the normal course. So we were bludgeoned into it by fragmentation within our own party. What do you say we could do here from the Heritage Foundation? Um, because yes, the Democrats have a capacity to bludgeon, but then so do we. Sure. Well, I think the best thing would be one of the problems with people with strong ideological fortitude is that they sometimes let the excellent be the enemy of the good. And that's a trap that I think we all have to avoid falling into. Because the choice wasn't between a strong military and a lower deficit. The choice was between that deficit and no big help to the military. So the president had to make a value judgment. And at this point in time, given what's going on in Syria, the atrocities and the gas attacks and everything, given what's going on in Iran, given what's going on in North Korea, given what's going on wherever you want, he felt that the single most important obligation he had is to defend the American people and keep us secure. Now that we've gotten that big budget, they don't, they're not going to have the same leverage over him next time. But the, the, the problem is that with a very fragile majority in uh, the Congress, um, if our side doesn't hang together, 
Well, then we have to deal with the other side. And that's just a fact of life. So trying to get people to understand that we can't always get everything that's the most ideologically pure at a given moment in time. The president announced today that he's going to be making some efforts at decisions uh, in the budget, and we'll see if we can get more support for that. He hates the uh, bill that was signed. Uh, those of you who watched it on TV know I was right there with him when it happened. And it was not his favorite day, I can tell you that. Ours here, and I'm I, sure that comes as no surprise. No, no, it, it, it doesn't. <laughs> but but the, the solution to it is not confusing. If we had had 100% of the Republicans voting for a bill, we, we would have had a much lower deficit built in. So even though they were being very principled and were trying to hold down the budget deficit, so I don't question the motive. Problem is the arithmetic didn't work. It doesn't work. And therefore, we had to make this terrible choice. Um, be tolerant. <laughs> um, Not when it comes to deficits. No, well, we hate it too, but <laughs> w w would you rather have an army and a navy and an air force that can't defend you? Okay, well, that's the Scylla and Solibdus kind of choice that we, that we had to make. As I say, he's, you're not going to see that out of him going forward. Um, and hopefully, as we get through the November cycle, hopefully we'll have a little bit better uh, negotiating position. I certainly hope so. We'd all be better off. He is not a deficit drug any stretch of the imagination. Concern about programs like XM and OPIC. Um, those are both very complicated uh, issues. Um, I think one can argue that we probably do need some kind of a financing mechanism in global uh, trade. Uh, if for no other reason than to with what the Chinese and the European Union are doing. The GE payment cost a big project in Egypt. Not a very strong credit, not very highly ranked on your chart. Why did they lose it? The, the Chinese government provided 30-year, 1.5% financing. Now, that's not a market rate. I'm not sure that there is a market for 30-year debt for Egypt, let alone at 1.5%. But that poses a conundrum. Are we better off just letting them do that and take away several thousand American jobs or having something to be somewhat competitive? That's the, what makes it so complicated. Nobody's in favor of corporate welfare. We certainly are not. But we also live in a world that we don't totally control. And we, at some point, have to draw the line, again, the good versus the excellent. The, the excellent driving out the good. Excellent would be neither he nor the Chinese nor anybody else provides concessionary funding. But when other people are doing it, you've got to make the choice. Jobs or doing something your principles don't like you to do. It's a tough decision. It's a tough decision. Uh, OPIC is very much the same kind of a concept, just smaller scale. Mr. Secretary, unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. And uh, at, we here at the Heritage Foundation want to thank you and the President we know that some of the issues that you face are very difficult ones and sometimes require some tough choices. But please always know uh, that we stand at the ready here to be supportive and appreciate your being here today as we uh, celebrate the release of our index. Absolutely.
Absolutely, uh, glad very, to stand. Very, very important issue. Glad to stand with you on that one, and we're just getting started. Good. So Good. thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us today, and uh, we want to show our appreciation to the secretary for being here. Thank you. Thank you.